Good evening everybody and welcome to what is revision for F8 Audit and Assurance for the March 2017 exam. And this is revision class number three. So let me remind you where we have got to in our revision so far. The aim is very, very straightforward with F8. We've got to make sure we've had good practice on as many questions as we can on the three big core areas, risk and response, internal controls, substantive procedures. All are coming up whether you like it or not, they are always there. And the reason we practice these, of course, is that there is not a huge amount of knowledge required for any of the three of them. There is a bit of knowledge and a bit of understanding that will certainly help. But the main thrust of it is can you come up with ideas? For risk and response and for internal controls, it's often looking at a scenario and finding the things in the scenario. But with substantive procedures, which I think makes it a bit harder than the other two, you've got to look at a scenario and generate tests to deal with it. So it's not finding things, it's inventing things. And that, of course, is going to be harder. We've already, at the halfway point in revision, made sure that we have covered revision questions in all three of those core areas and we're going to be doing some more of that in this third session as well as well as touching on some of the additional sessions or sections of the course that we've got left to go. Okie dokie then let us uh, continue and as I have done uh, in the first two sessions we will intersperse the questions with some technical stuff. And some technical stuff is where we are going to begin tonight. So I have been dotting around some audit standards, some ICES, in amongst the long questions. Why am I doing that? Well, if you understand the audit standards, it will help with at least some of the MCQ questions that you need to answer, so there's a knowledge angle to this. But also, within the three long questions, there are going to be, I would think at least over those three questions, maybe four or five, four to five mark questions, which will be technical in their nature. And since, even if there's only three of these, it's worth more than 10 marks in total, it's worth making sure that we have a reasonable understanding and an ability to explain as many audit standards as we can. And I think ISA 560 is one of the more difficult ones. Uh, one of the problems with it is it ties in with accounting rules and the accounting rules are often not known as well as they should be, so there's a technical issue there. And the second issue with it is the beginning of this standard is pretty straightforward, but everyone tends to remember the nastier bit at the end, and then forgets the easier stuff at the beginning. So if you are asked to explain the auditor's responsibilities regarding subsequent events, it is worth remembering that the start of this, if we just draw ourselves a pretty picture. So here's the client's year end, their accounting year end. The starting point of this is to say that the auditor's duty primarily ends when the auditors sign their audit report. So all the way up from the moment you're appointed at the AGM up until you sign the audit report, you are said to have an active audit duty. Now, what does that actually mean? Uh, well, active is doing something, and in auditing, if you are doing something, it is typically that you are analysing, enquiring, inspecting, observing, and recalculating. In other words, you are doing audit work. 
And of course, once you write your report at the end of an exercise, you shouldn't really have any more duties because if you've written your report, that's game over, isn't it? So your job is to keep actively auditing up till that point. One of the reasons why you have to keep auditing up to that point is that you will have signed your audit report just after the directors have signed off the accounts. And once they've signed off the accounts, that should be it. The accounts, the financial statements should not be changing anymore, probably. And if the accounts are finished, you can give your opinion knowing that that's it. So the auditor comes in after the year end and does what is known as their final audit, ending with the signing of the audit report. So just to be clear, we go slightly after the directors sign the accounts. Uh, and one of the reasons why we have to wait until after they've signed the accounts is one specific accounting standard. Now let's take this carefully. The accounting rules tell the directors what to do in preparing the accounts. The auditing standards tell us auditors what to do in our audit process. So accounting rules. And the relevant accounting rule I'm thinking of here is accounting standard 10 events after the reporting period, E-A-R-P. And IAS 10 says that some of the things happening in that red period there after the year end are potentially going to change the accounts for the year that has just finished. Because those events can be adjusting. And if they're non-adjusting, they might still require to be disclosable in the financial statements of the year that has just finished. So in here is what I'm talking about. And because uh, IAS 10 uh, defines EARPs as events in between the year end and when the directors authorize the accounts for issue, which they do by signing them, those events potentially changing last year's accounts are still going on until the directors put their signature at the bottom of the financial statements. So we must keep auditing because those events are going on. They're happening as we are doing our work. And any of them could, in theory, be adjusting or disclosable. Now, I think that bit is relatively straightforward. Relatively. It's the second bit of the duties which then gets a bit complicated. The point is that those financial statements are not totally final until the annual general meeting when the shareholders vote on them. And that creates a potential problem. Before we look at the problem, let's go back to the duty. because we still have a little bit of duty left up until the AGM because the accounts are not quite yet final. And this duty here is known as passive. Meaning we don't have to go looking for trouble, but if anything happens and we are told about it, we've got to do something about it. And that creates the potential for fun. The fun being, what if a material mistake is discovered after both the client and we, the auditors, have signed everything off? Well, if it's before the AGM, the directors really ought to do something about it and correct it. If they refuse to do that, we will go along to the AGM and tell the shareholders that a late mistake was discovered, too late for us to do anything about, and the directors have decided not to change it in the accounts, which is really wrong. The interesting thing is what happens if they do correct it.
And if they put that correction through, there are three things as auditor I ought to do. Not sure first is the best word there actually. Let's make it the original. If that happens, three things I ought to do. Number one, if they've made a correction, let's make sure they've got it right. Number two, if you let the finance director open up the software and go and change one thing, there is a risk that the cheeky finance director goes and changes a few other things as well. So go and check everything else from the revised accounts back to the original ones and make sure nothing else has been changed. And it's the third point, which is probably technically the most confusing. Because I've just said, make sure they've made no other changes. But maybe they need to make other changes. And the reason why other corrections might be needed is because now those financial statements have been reissued on a later date. This red line here starts going again. And now there are events after the reporting period in between the date that the first accounts were signed and the new set have been signed and they might be adjusting or they might be disclosable and I don't know because I've not looked at any of those because I had stopped. So I need to extend my active duty by testing what has taken place since I initially signed my audit report because there might have been additional adjusting or disclosable events after the reporting period that took place in that time. Now I think that is probably the hardest of all the audit standards on the course to think through properly and also you can see it's taken a little while to explain it. That could easily fill out a five mark question. Easily. So it's one of those where it's worth thinking, not writing it out in full necessarily, but trying to picture my diagram or maybe even reconstruct the diagram yourself to help get it into your head just in case. Wonderful. Well, there's a little bit of technical revision to warm our brains up in this third session. But now we really ought to continue onwards and take a look at another question. Now we've been working with substantive procedures most recently, so I'm going to start with another substantive procedures question. But we're also going to do some more work on internal controls tonight. Uh, I think, therefore, a good starting point would be to go and look at the March-June 2016 paper. So, relatively recent one, of course, uh, start of uh, last year. And we're going to take a look at question number three. go. Uh, 
Uh, and there in the middle of the screen, you can see the requirements. As always with uh, this exam, with any exam really, read the requirements first, understand what the question is all about, and then let's have a technique, and then we read the story. And it says, for each of the two subsequent events described above. Now be careful at this point. Those who've got the technical knowledge might be tempted to see the word subsequent events and start detailing everything I've just done up on the screen. Wait for it. It doesn't say explain subsequent event responsibilities of auditors. It says, based on the information provided, explain whether the financial statements require amendment. Which means you're being tested on your accounting knowledge. If there are subsequent events happening after the year end, I'd imagine IAS 10, events after the reporting period, is going to be relevant to this, maybe other standards as well, but that's an accounting question. Part two, describe audit procedures which should now be performed in order to form a conclusion on any required amendment. So the logic of this question is, when you read these two stories, you should be able to say, well, it looks like they should do this. But that is assuming the information in the stories is correct, which means we need to make sure that the information in the stories has been checked properly, because otherwise our answer to the first part of this might prove to be wrong. Whenever we see audit procedures, we are thinking AEIOU. I'm also thinking DADA3 might help me with ideas. But there's something else I do as well. If a question says, what audit procedures would I do on trade receivables, I've got nothing to work with apart from these idea generation techniques and a bit of memory from the past. But when I'm given a story to play with, the story is going to have facts, figures, dates, events in it. And from my experience, the best way of picking up the procedures marks is test every fact, amount, date in the story. It's only a 10 mark question. Uh, remember on your exam, you'll have a 30, a 20 and a 20. But within any of those three questions, one of these 10 mark sections could easily appear. So there's no problem with practicing this. But with two events and 10 marks, we've only got five marks per event. In order to get those five marks, we've got to talk about whether the accounts need changing. I would guess that's going to be at least two of the marks, which means we're looking for about three procedures, three tests. So my technique is go and find three facts in each of the two stories and ask yourself, how do you know that those facts you're being presented with are true. Okay, here we go then. Grains for you, manufactures breakfast cereals, and has three factories, four warehouses, and three distribution depots spread across North America. The audit for the year ended 31st of December 2015 is almost complete. And the financial statements and audit report are due to be signed shortly. Now, that would suggest that some audit work might have already taken place on the two things we're about to read. So we'll be careful when we read this, because if it says your audit staff have already checked this by doing this, you won't get marks for them writing that as a procedure, because it's done already. Profit before tax is 7.9 million. And I would imagine the reason we're being told that is because it allows us to assess the materiality of what's going on in these two events. And that's important because the accounts only need to be amended for material things. So there must be one mark in each of the two stories for calculating how material things look and then forming a conclusion as to whether they are material or not. 
The following events have occurred subsequent to the year end and no amendments or disclosures have been made in the financial statements. So for now, the accounts do not reflect these two events at all. So for the first event, we need the accounts. I suspect we need a materiality calculation. And we need some audit procedures, some tests. And we know that each event is worth five marks. If you are at all worried about your accounting, the best way to get the marks out of this is do the procedures and the materiality, or the other way around if you like. And the accounting is going to be the most technical, so I'd be tempted to do that bit last, if you are nervous about your accounting knowledge. So let's see what we can get out of here then. So profit is 7.9 million in the accounts as they currently stand. Uh, on the 15th of February 2016, so after the year end, a fire occurred at the largest of the distribution depots. Now the moment I see fire, I am reminded of several past exam questions recently where we have had fires, floods, accidents, uh, what else have we had? Earthquake, I think. And I know that all of those are non-adjusting events because they are all sudden events. They are not a previous story carrying on, which means they've got nothing to do with December the 31st when no such fire had taken place. The fire resulted in extensive damage to 40% of the company's vehicles used for dispatching goods to customers. However, there have been no significant delays to customer deliveries. Now, what is that telling me? It's telling me that the company has been able to continue operating and there is no obvious going concern issue based on what I've read so far. The company estimates the level of damage to the vehicles to be in excess of 650 grand. So there's a nice easy materiality thing then because 650k divided by 7.9 million. Well, if you're any good at mental arithmetic, you'll know that 10% uh, of 7.9 is 790, 5% is half of that, which is 395. So this is closer to 10% than 5%, and anything above 5% of profit we would normally consider material. But what you are going to do is you're going to get a calculator, and you are going to do the calculation. Oh, not like that, you're not. So this is where not wearing glasses is going to cause me problems. Uh, 650 divided by 7.9. Uh, so that's 8.2%. So what you do is you say that's 8.2% of profit. And that that is a material loss to the company. Now that is assuming it is a loss to the company. If they've got insurance, it may well be the fact that they're going to get all this money back. And as such, no money is lost. Only a minimum level of inventory, approximately 25 grand, was damaged. Now, I would not bother doing the calculation because clearly 25 is going to be a lot less than 5% of profit. But if you want to make absolutely sure, you could write in here uh, the inventory is not material. Or alternatively, you could add the 25k to the 650, uh, which won't make a massive change to that percentage. But any attempt to do any sort of sensible calculation on materiality will be fine. Whoops, not there. There. Grains Insurance Company has started to investigate the fire to assess the likelihood, level of payment. However, there are concerns the fire was started deliberately and if true, would invalidate any insurance cover. And that is why the company might be at risk 
of suffering a fair bit of a loss here. So my materiality calculation seems to make some sense. I need to talk about the accounting, but it's so much easier to get the procedures marks. Just test everything it says. Now I'm pretty sure that this question came up in the March sitting of the paper. Uh, given the year ends the 31st of December, I doubt that would have been a June question. So if it's currently March, and what, about two weeks ago there was a fire, how would I know that there was a fire? Well, one thing I might want to do is visit the site of the fire to physically inspect it Now, the only thing that's making me worried about this is they might have already cleared it up. And why am I doing this? Always say why. To verify that a fire has occurred and to assess the scale of the damage. So remember how this paper tends to be marked. Half a mark for suggesting a valid procedure, half a mark for giving a valid reason why you're doing it. It then says, the company estimates the level of damage to the vehicles to be in excess of 650. Well, where did they get that number from? And what do they mean by $650,000 worth of damage? Is that their estimated repair bill? The cost of buying new vehicles? So I think we need to inspect a copy of the estimated repair bill or a proposed order of replacement vehicles, because I'm not sure which one it is. And on exam day, you don't have to write both of those. I'm just doing this largely for your benefit so you understand what it is I'm trying to do. And as always, to verify the $650,000 estimate, appears valid. I could also check on the inventory side of things, but because that is an immaterial amount, I think it's less worth checking that. What else does it say? Uh, Grains Insurance Company started to investigate, concerns, fire, deliberate, etc. How do I know what the insurance company is doing, what they are thinking? What I do is I inspect correspondence with insurer. Again, to assess, to verify, something along those lines. The likelihood they will pay And if so, the amount. And since there is a suggestion there is an insurance policy, and also a suggestion that if this was deliberate, it would invalidate that policy, I suppose I might also inspect the insurance policy. Just confirming everything I'm reading in the story. To confirm the insurance would be invalid if fire was deliberate. 
I reckon I need a maximum of three valid tests. I've gone one over the top for safety. I think I've got plenty. There are other things you could test. Uh, it says only 25 grand of inventory was affected. Uh, a E I O U, analyze, probably not E. Enquire, I'm likely to ask the staff who work at the site to confirm uh, the damage that they have seen. I might read the board minutes because after a big fire, the board would discuss it and surely they would talk about the damage that has occurred, wouldn't they? So board minutes could be another source of evidence on this. As long as you are specific and don't just write, read the board minutes. Read board minutes to verify details of the damage which the directors have discussed should get you a mark because you're being specific. So I say go for the materiality and go for the procedures. And then the accounting side of things, well, if you get this wrong, less of a problem because what you really need to write is that the fire is a non adjusting EARP under IAS 10 because the fire in February 2016 gives no evidence of damage existing at the year end, which was the 31st of December. It's irrelevant to the company's year end position. However, since it is material, it should be disclosed in a financial statement note. Now I've pretty much in blue written in full the answer that I could put in. Uh, the reason I've laid it out like this is to help break down the requirement for you and show you that in effect there are likely to be three separate ways of earning marks here. Just to repeat, the easiest ways, materiality calculation, audit procedures, just test everything she tells you. And then have a go at the accounting. So that's event number one. Let's now look at event number two. On the 18th of February, they're having a bad February, aren't they? Uh, it was discovered that a large batch of Grain's new cereal brand, Loopy Green Loops, sounds delicious, doesn't it? Held in inventory at the year end was defective, as the cereal contained too much green food colouring. To date, no sales of this new cereal have been made. Well, that's a relief, otherwise you'd start getting sued by Americans who are turning green because they've eaten the wrong cereal. The cost of the defective batch is 915. The defects cannot be corrected. However, the scrapped cereal can be utilized as a raw material for an alternative cereal brand, presumably called Loopy Really Green Loops, at a value of 50 grand. So you can use it and avoid having to buy another raw material. So it has a bit of scrap value, in other words. Now, I'm comfortable with my accounting knowledge, so I'm going to go straight into that. You might not be, of course. And under IAS2, inventory should be held or valued at the lower of cost, which in this case is uh, 915,000 or net realizable value. And the best way they can get any value out of this is by using it as an alternative raw material. And that is therefore 50. Meaning year end inventory should be written down by the difference.
Now I really ought to write something else in addition to that. I'm saying it needs to be written down, but that is not mentioning why it needs to be written down. I mean, we know it's damaged in February. The point is it was damaged at the year end. So I would write the inventory was unusable as at year end. meaning the discovery of the problem in February 2016 is an adjusting event after the reporting period. Again, let me repeat, this second one I'm doing in logical order but the stuff I've written so far is the hardest bit of the answer. There are much easier marks for saying 865,000 divided by uh, 7.9 million, was it? Well, that's clearly more than 10%, but we'll do the calculation because it's worth it. 865, whoops, divided by 7.9, it's 10.9. Remember, anything over 5% is likely to be material. And then we need some procedures. Again, test everything you've been told. They've discovered stuff was defective on the 18th of February. How do you know? Inspect internal quality control report or emails or whatever else was sent from the 18th of February 2016 to verify the fault and date of discovery It also tells you that there was 915 grand's worth of this stuff in year-end inventory. How do you know? Inspect year-end inventory list. And I suppose stock tape testing records just to make sure that the inventory list was correct. To verify, you find yourself writing those words a lot on this exam, to verify 915k was held at the year end. But it also says that it can't be sold and the only other available use apparently is in a replacement of some other raw material in some other product. How do we know they can use it? And how do we know that it would save them 50 grand of other raw material? That's quite a technical question. I don't think the directors would be the best people to ask. I'd ask the production manager. Obtain written confirmation. So inquire and confirm. From production manager or someone similar to verify the serial can be used as a raw material in another product at a value of 50k and I suppose now I want to go further and check that 50k figure is right. Um, I mean, I might just uh, rely on the production manager for that. 
because in order to work out 50K, I'd need to know how much of the other raw material they would normally have used will be saved as a result of this, and then go and look at purchase invoices of that to verify it normally costs 50K. But I think I've got the marks already, so my temptation is to stop. Again, I might get marks for inspecting board minutes. If I'm specific, what would I be saying? Inspect board minutes to uh, verify this was discussed at board meeting, uh, including the amounts and what the plan of the company is. I mean, you could almost imagine the conversation, couldn't you? Oh, what? We've put too much, raw, uh, too much green colouring in it. Oh, can we do anything with it? We can't take the green colouring out. Great. So we're going to have to throw it away, right? Oh, production guy saying we can use it and at least get 50 grand. So the details will be in the minutes, won't they? Uh, I would imagine, along with some sort of comment about why did this happen, who is to blame, and who's going to get sacked, possibly. Uh, and there we have it. We have got ourselves an answer. So one final time, I will repeat that the best technique for answering these scenario-based substantive procedures questions is test every fact in the story. If there are numbers, calculate materiality. If you're asked about accounting changes, if you're confident, go for it. If you're not confident, go for it. But don't spend too much time on it if you're not confident when there are much easier materiality and audit test marks. That can be obtained. Yay. Wonderful. Well, before we look at yet another question, I think it would be wise for a bit more technical revision to just break those questions up. And next on my list of things for us to look at is a reminder about computer controls. So the idea here is that when companies have anything computerized going on, of which, of course, there is a lot these days, they need to have internal controls over those computer processes. And if I've got a computerized working environment, I need controls over that environment as a whole and also over the specific data going into the machine. And controls over the computer environment are called general controls. Controls over the data are called application controls. General controls are the bit which is much easier uh, for you to think about because general controls are the things that you and I are likely to do with our computers. So they are things like regularly back up your data. Obvious, right? Antivirus software. Now, maybe you don't go on training courses, but when Windows bring out Windows 10, Windows 11, you've got to update yourself on how to use them properly, haven't you? So it's things like that. Application controls, I think, are harder because this is about the actual data in the machine, which means it's controls happening within the software you use, which you probably don't get to see much of. They are things like making sure that all the numbers in a numbering system are present.
If a piece of data is not dealt with the way it should have been, there's some problem, a report should come out so the user knows that something's gone wrong. Easiest example I can give to you of this is when you send an email and you type in 25 email addresses because it's going to lots of people and one of them bounces back. The bounce back is an exception report so you know there has been a problem. Field limits, just give you one more, is where you can't type in any number you like into a particular uh, field, uh, you are limited in a certain range to stop stupid numbers, either accidentally or on purpose, being typed in. So, uh, not an area we'd expect to see much of in the long questions, but potentially an MCQ. Uh, you could be given, I don't know, a list of four controls and be asked which two are general controls and which two are application or something like that. And while we're on the subject of computers, let's squeeze another bit of technical reminder in with computer assisted audit techniques or CATS for short. So this is auditors using computers to help us in our work. We gain evidence in two basic ways. We test controls. And we do substantive procedures. And the main bit of CAT that we use for testing controls is called test data. And test data are fake transactions entered into a system to see if controls happen as they should. So a silly example maybe, but it will help to remind you what we're talking about here. Um, Buckingham Palace, where the Queen lives, I would imagine has pretty good security. So if someone tried to climb over the wall to get into Buckingham Palace, you'd imagine guards appear pretty quickly, and if that person doesn't get down, they're going to find a bullet going somewhere painful. How would I use test data? Uh, I will go and climb the wall of Buckingham Palace and see if someone shoots me. A bit of an extreme audit technique, but you would find out, wouldn't you? Substantive procedures uh, and computer-assisted audit techniques is about using something called audit software. Now this one is a little bit harder for the exam. Test data is a very specific thing. Fake transactions, that's it. That's pretty much all you need to know. Uh, although if you are going to put fake transactions into your client's accounting records, please take them out again afterwards. Audit software involves, as the name suggests, computer application. It's an app. And you are going to attach this app to your client's data and get your app to do things that you need to happen for the audit. Why are you doing this? Because computers are much quicker at handling vast amounts of data than humans are. So for those bits of the audit that require handling a lot of numbers, get some software to do it for you. Examples would be reorganizing the client's data. Now that might be as simple as listing all the assets, not in the order they're on the asset register, but by value. So you can focus your testing on the more valuable ones. Or you might do by date of purchase because you want to focus your efforts on the newer assets or the older assets. The most obvious example uh, with recalculation would be depreciation calculations. Typically depreciation is not done by a human. The asset register will do it automatically. But how do you know it's doing it right? Attach a bit of software to recalculate and see if you get the same numbers.
We have talked about doing things like uh, receivables days. And if receivables days are going up, that tells you that customers are taking longer to pay, suggests a bad and doubtful debt issue. Likewise, inventory days going up suggests that inventory is selling more slowly and might suggest an obsolescence problem. But wouldn't you really like to know which customers are slowing down payment and which inventory lines, which products are not selling? Then you can target your audit testing to know where the actual problems are. Well, there's no problem with calculating receivables days on a customer by customer basis and inventory days on a product by product basis unless of course there are 57,000 customers and 48 million products and that's where the computer comes in handy it allows you to do detailed analytical procedures much more quickly than a human could do it and if you want your sample to be truly random don't let a human pick it, let a computer do it. If you want to pick a sample selection where you pick all items that have a particular feature, get a computer to do it. Again, uh, email uh, provides us with a very simple illustration of that. I sometimes think, oh yes, I sent an attachment but I don't know who I sent it to. Well, what do you do? You go and search through your emails for every email that has an attachment on it. Or maybe I know that within an email, I mentioned a particular topic. So you go and search all the emails that have just that topic mentioned. It's the same stuff. It's the power of computers to make our lives easier. So that is computer assisted audit techniques. And having done some technical revision, I do declare it is time for us to have a go at another exam question. And the next one I have on my agenda, I think, is this one. Yes, it is. So the next one we're going to look at is December 2014. And we're going to look at question number five. Just to prove I'm not lying, as always, December 14. Uh, December 14, by the way, was the first sitting when multiple choice questions were added to the F8 paper. So anything older than this, no MCQs ever. They are the old style MCQs. So they are individual, no big story behind them. Uh, but they still uh, test your knowledge perfectly well. They're perfectly decent ones to practice. Uh, in fact, while we're here, a quick break. Uh, which two of the following should be included in an audit engagement letter? Well, an audit engagement letter is the thing done at the beginning of the audit to agree how the audit will work with the client. It's like the contract. So... What the audit's going to do, well, that sounds like something we need to agree at the beginning. And any contract agrees the responsibilities of both sides. So one and three are looking highly likely. Results of previous audits doesn't go in an engagement letter. The results of previous audits goes into an audit plan to help the auditors know what things have happened in the past that may well happen again this year. That's about the audit work. It's not about how you'll do the audit. Uh, need to maintain professional scepticism is something that you tell your audit staff. So again, it's not something you'd be talking to the client about. Uh, so the answer has to be B. And that to me looks like a fairly easy question. Common sense. But that is not why we are here. We are here to do a long question. Number five. As always, we go straight to the requirements first and we see we've got 16 marks of something and four of something else. Let's start with the four. Describe substantive procedures. Right, it'll either be a balance or it will give us some sort of story. 
the auditor should perform to confirm Hummingbird Co's revenue. Well, maybe the story will tell us how Hummingbird earns its money. And if it does, the story will give me some help. But at the moment, I have nothing. All I know is a sales revenue figure. So what I do is I say sales revenue, profit or loss, which means the assertions I'll need to be targeting for profit or loss item are going to be completeness, occurrence, cutoff, classification, presentation, and A, the accuracy of the numbers. Those are the assertions I need to target. There are four marks available, which means I need four tests. Say four things and why I am doing those four things. Not all the assertions are necessarily going to generate that many ideas. And I'll tell you now that presentation and classification are unlikely to get me very far with revenue. The ones you want to target always are completeness, the opposite of completeness, which is occurrence for the profit or loss or existence on the statement of financial position, and anything to do with the numbers. Depending on what I read in the story, cutoff may well be a good idea as well. But you don't need four separate assertions to get your four marks. You might be able to come up with four tests on just the accuracy of the figures. Because part B does not say which assertions we need to test. It just says confirm revenue. And the thing is, even if I don't read the story, I can already think of four tests I would do on any company's revenue. Now, if you can read the story and make something more targeted to this company, that's a safer approach to take. But it's not that much safer, because if there are four tests we do on revenue at every single company, unless there's something very weird about this company's revenue in the story, I reckon the following are going to work. And I like this, and doing this one first, because I don't have to read the story to get the marks. It's a much quicker and more efficient way of getting marks. The first part of this question, as we'll see, is a controls deficiencies question, and you can't answer that unless you've read the story. So, tests I would do on revenue. Unless the story is going to tell me something weird, it should be the case that if I select Goods Dispatch Notes, from through the year, check to, oh, is this going to fit? Corresponding invoices and inspect sales day book to verify these were included. Now I've said why I'm doing it, but the word for this is completeness. If you just want to make sure, that should get a, uh, should get a mark. And having done that, if I then just do that test in reverse, Select invoices from, I should have written SDB, shouldn't I? It's sales, day, book. Let's do that in case I want to write it again. I can save some time uh, through the year. And trace back to uh, 
goods dispatch notes to verify items were sent to customers because that's typically proof that you have earned that revenue. Again, I've said to verify, but what we are checking there is our currents. Let's have an accuracy test. Uh, well, the invoices all get recorded in the sales daybook. So uh, select pages from sales. I've written this already, haven't I? SDB through year. And add up pages to verify accuracy of totals at end of each page. There's number three. And maybe a cutoff test. Pick the final few GDNs before the year end and find corresponding invoices and inspect sales daybook before year end to verify these invoices were included. And that, oh dear, is a cutoff test. Likewise, checking the goods dispatch notes after the year end against the invoices to make sure the invoices were not included would be another cutoff test. I could have checked that the totals in the sales daybook agree to the revenue T account and that the balance on the revenue T account, T account equals the figure in the profit or loss account. And that would get me marks as well. Uh, I could pick out a few invoices and make sure the calculations on them are accurate. Uh, you know, the VAT has been properly separated from what is the net revenue, um, stuff like that. I could check post year end credit notes to see if any pre year end sales were then cancelled after the year end. Loads I can do because I've practiced this. And if you've practiced it, you get pretty good at it fairly quickly. As they say in Russia, Poltrenia Matsugenia. Repetition is the mother of education. It's a bit of a blunt instrument, but repeat, repeat, repeat. It works. Gets you good at stuff very quickly. Now, I will, of course, be reading the story uh, in a second or two. And if I find anything in the story that means anything I've written down doesn't make sense, well, that would be annoying, wouldn't it? Which is why I would think up these tests, maybe make a tiny little note of what I would do without writing them in full, then read the story and just make sure. Okay, we now need to go and read the rest of the requirements and then look at the story. Part A, as the external auditor of Hummingbird, write a report to management in respect to the sales system described above, which identifies and explains seven deficiencies and provides a recommendation. And a covering letter is required. That's why it's 16 marks. It's 14 for that and two for the covering letter. Now that makes the covering letter really annoying because it's going to take probably more time than you would like to get the letter done, because you actually have to write a letter. The good news is it's a totally standard letter, so if you know what goes into it, it's a very easy two marks. It just might take you slightly more minutes than you would like. Let's do the letter first. So, no need to make anything up. Just write address of audit firm, address of client. We would traditionally have a date. So uh, what is your exam? It's the 6th of March, 2017. And then over here, 
Dear Sirs. I would then put a title in. Uh, report on control deficiencies. And then I'm thinking content. And there are three main bits of content I want to go into this letter. First thing, tell them what you are sending them. As agreed on our appointment, we now enclose our report on control deficiencies and our recommendations to deal with these for your sales system. You then need two disclaimers. Please note these are only the problems found while we audited your financial statements So it might not be a comprehensive list of problems that exist. And secondly, this report should not be shown to anyone outside the company without our prior written agreement. Now in the real world, uh, there would be two other things I would put in here, but for two marks, there's a limit. I mean, I'm already over time. The main reason why it's worth going slightly over time on this is because it's standard and you're going to get it right. It's a guaranteed two marks. Um, other things I could put in, uh, a request for them to respond to the deficiencies in our recommendations as to whether they plan to put these recommendations in place or not. And a thank you for all the help their staff gave us during the audit. But if you want to sign it off at that point, kind regards, auditors. And there we have it, one covering letter. But that's not very exciting, and you only do one of those if the question requires it. The bit, of course, which is far more important, is we have got to go through the story and find seven deficiencies. And then recommend improvements. Before we do that, let me remind you of some tactics at this point. I'm guessing you will find most of the deficiencies you need, but just in case, we look out for the word not, because if they are not doing something, I'm guessing they probably should have been. We look out for what clerks are doing, because clerks should be doing low-level stuff and not making any decisions. We look out for things that are being done manually, because maybe they could be automated. And we look out for things that appear to be done verbally, because maybe they should have been documented. Recommendations. When it comes to making our recommendations, the only real thing we need to be careful with is don't just repeat the deficiency in reverse. The company does not check this. Recommendation, check this. No, that's not going to get you credit. You need to add something. Try to say who could do it, how they could do it, 
when they could do it, maybe how often they could do it. Just add something. My advice, as you know, is to read the whole story through, see how many deficiencies we can find, and then pick those that we are most comfortable explaining and we can come up with a sensible recommendation for. And when we talk about explaining them, explain them in terms of the potential damage to the company. So off we go. Hummingbird manufactures and sells luxury toiletries. They've been trading for over 20 years, year end 30th of September 2014. Hummingbird sells products to trade customers via its own website. This is 60% of revenue. Remaining revenue is generated by contracts to supply toiletries to hotels. And you would imagine if you're supplying toiletries to hotels, you think of all the little things you get in the hotel rooms, uh, the hotels might be ordering as and when they need stuff, but there's every chance there's just a regular delivery sent because they'd be using stuff pretty much continuously, wouldn't they? Um, since they are selling stuff via the website, that is where, to me, the biggest potential cutoff problem could happen. Because if that website recognises the sale when the order's being placed, but the goods haven't been sent yet, well, they're recognising the sale too early. So going back to what I wrote in part B and my tests, in my last test, when I'm doing cutoff, I might want to add in here, especially for website sales. That shows I've read the story and I'm not just writing down every test I can think of, so I am trying to apply it at least, and that would be the biggest danger. Right, back we go then. So we know they earn their money in two different ways, fine. Uh, we're gonna hear about the second bit of the revenue first. Hotel revenue is made up of four key customers. Hummingbird has one sales clerk, here we go. Brenda, who maintains all aspects of the revenue stream. Orders, invoices, processes, payments. Well, there is my first deficiency then. There is a lack of segregation of duties as Brenda does everything. Well, that highlights a deficiency, but all I've done there is just copied from the story. I need to say why this is a problem. So what could she do? Well, she could do all sorts of things. This is a sales system, which means she could be inventing fake sales and then delivering stuff to her own home. She could be doing deals with customers, special deals, and then splitting the difference between them. I mean, if customers are hotels, there's an obvious reward for Brenda, isn't there? Some nice weekends away in nice hotels. Now, of course, what I could have written is Brenda could be committing fraud, but the word fraud encompasses so many possibilities. So if you can add a bit of colour to it and actually give some examples, all the better. Now at the moment, I'm not going to make a recommendation 
because there's no point saying her work should be spread amongst other staff until we've read the story and have some idea as to whether those other staff exist. If this is a relatively small company, they might not have any other staff. So let's just hold fire because the recommendation will partly be impacted by what I read in the rest of the story. Just get ahead of ourselves a bit here. In raising invoices, the sales system automatically inserts the online trade customer prices for products. Right, so the online sales, uh, the prices are put in automatically. That is good, by the way. That is a strength. It maximizes the chance that the prices are the right prices. No human involvement. However, each hotel customer has contracted prices which are lower than the online prices and hence Brenda manually edits the invoices prior to dispatch. You should not have clerks changing invoices. So the invoice would put the normal price on. Brenda is deciding the prices. Sort of similar to my first point, actually. So Brenda, manually, changes prices for the hotel customers. She might make errors. Or do favours for hotels by charging less in return for free hotel stays. Now this is what I was getting at with reading the whole story first. Obviously I'm not doing that because in the scope of this course, if I read through the whole story, I'll end up explaining them as we go, and then I'll explain them again as I write them down, and that takes up too much time for the course. The danger with doing them as you go is I'm now looking at my first two and thinking, are they separate enough? Because they're both about Brenda and what Brenda does. Is there a risk I don't get marks for both of them? Possibly, and that's why it's worth reading the whole thing. Uh, but now I've got this one down, uh, when it's manual, the obvious solution is automate. There's only four customers. So I would say that the website should be programmed such that each customer has a password or code of some sort that ensures their agreed prices are automatically applied to their invoices. I would also say these prices should be password protected so only the sales director can change them or something like that. So trying to add some detail to the answer, not just say Brenda manually changes prices, solution, Brenda should not manually change prices, which is a rubbish answer. This question could have had a third section that then said, uh, what control tests would you do on your recommendations? How would you know that the prices can only be changed by the sales director's password? Answer, test data. Try changing the prices with someone else's password, like Brenda's password. Uh, how do you know that prices are automatically applied to invoices? 
put in a fake order from one of these hotel customers and see if it works. More test data. So there we have the first two of our answer. Let's do another one while we're having a bit of a flow. Uh, online revenue. New trade customers are set up in the Sales Ledger Master File upon passing suitable credit checks and a credit limit is set. Well, there, if the question had asked for strengths, and sometimes questions do, are some more good things going on. But we don't want good things for this question. We only want deficiencies. Uh, credit limit is set at this stage. At this stage. I think that's a subtle hint that we're not going to hear anything about credit limits ever again, meaning they're not being updated over time. But let's wait and see. Customers place online orders up to their preset credit limit. They receive an email confirmation and the sales order interfaces into the dispatch system. Ooh, presumably checking that you've got the goods in stock. The order number is linked to the customer account number. Okay. Uh, that makes me slightly nervous that the order number is not in a sequence because different customers, if it's linked to that, it wouldn't be sequenced. But the ones I'm looking at here, I think are a little bit less obvious. So I'm going to keep going. Look for easier ones. Uh, goods are dispatched daily with a goods dispatch note, which is referenced to the sales order number, but are not, there we go, sequentially numbered. Hummingbird used to dispatch goods via a reliable national courier. However, to reduce costs, they've changed to a cheaper local courier and some orders have been delivered to customers late. So there we got a couple of things to deal with. GDNs are not sequentially numbered and the cheap courier company is delivering things late. So if GDNs are not sequenced, explain the consequences. If any GDNs are lost, There is no sequence gap to tell company a GDN is missing. As such, inventory records. may be inaccurate as goods have gone but no record of this. Don't just repeat the deficiency in reverse. Add something. I know GDN should be sequenced. How? Uh, the computer should automatically do it. How do you know it's working? Exception reports, perhaps. Uh, the dispatch system should automatically sequentially number all GDNs and inventory system should produce a daily exception report of any missing GDN numbers. There are many ways you can earn the marks in these sorts of questions. Your recommendations are going to be very practical and there could be many correct recommendations. So just trying to make sure you're adding some detail and some value so you've got some sort of explanation there. And as long as you come up with something vaguely sensible, you'll be fine. And then we have the cheap local courier company. Now, you've got to be common sense here. 
It's very tempting to say go back to the expensive one. Well, no, they've changed because of cost. So if they've gone cheaper, presumably they want to stay cheaper. Is there a way of keeping the local courier company whilst not suffering the lateness? Before we get to the recommendation though, late deliveries are a problem. Explain why. They will upset customers and this might result in customers changing to a more reliable supplier, reducing company profits. Pretty obvious. Now here we need a control not over our own staff, but a control over the courier company we are using. And what I would do is agree delivery time targets with courier company and review performance how often monthly quarterly let's go monthly and if consistently late put work out to tender and replace them now that's one thing uh, you could simply suggest you will not pay the bill if they are repeatedly late. Incentivize them financially. Makes sense to me. Now I've got four out of this already, still plenty to read. And trust me, we're gonna find more than seven without having to dip into some of the more complicated ones about their order numbering system and the fact that I don't think they ever change credit limits. They just put one in at the beginning and then leave it and both of those are weaknesses. Anyway, uh, we will take that point to have a break because we've been going for an hour and a half, which is pretty hard work for you guys. I can keep going for the next 18 years, of course, uh, but you do need a break. So at that point, we will take about a 10 minute break and we will start again at 7.40 UK time. I will see you in approximately 10 minutes.
Okay, my friends, I'm back finally, uh, and with a great example of internal control procedures and why they're so good, uh, which is, uh, in order to get back onto the floor where the studios are, there is a key code for the door. Uh, and I got there and had a total memory loss and couldn't remember what the blooming thing was. So it just goes to show that control procedures work. They keep dodgy people like me out. Anyhow, uh, we are looking at an internal controls question. We've done some substantive procedures, although I'll be revisiting that in a second. Uh, but we're doing the internal controls bit now, the big 16 marker. Two marks for our absolutely standard, straight out of a textbook covering letter, but 14 marks for finding deficiencies, explaining them, and providing recommendations. Just before we go back to the story, there was one that I saw in there about credit limits. Um, I'm not gonna write this in the answer because most students wouldn't spot it. Uh, credit limits are set at the beginning in this story. So when a new customer is signed up, and that's good, that's a strength. But as anyone with a credit card knows, from time to time, your credit limit is likely to be altered, either up or down. Because if you're not paying your bills, they'll wanna bring it down because you're a risk. And if you're paying your bills and spending quite a lot of money on it, they may well think that they want to put your balance up to encourage you to spend more and earn more money. So if you don't change someone's credit limit, you're missing out on additional revenue as a company uh, issuing credit, and you're potentially taking the risk of more bad debts. So credit limits should be reviewed on a regular basis by someone senior, or maybe more likely the computer should have an algorithm built into it so the computer can automatically calculate whether credit limits should be going up or down. But I won't write that one in the answer because most people wouldn't spot it because that's a bit of a hidden one. The story doesn't say credit limits are not then reviewed. It just doesn't bother mentioning it, which makes it harder to spot. So instead, we go back and see what else we can find in the final couple of paragraphs which is more obvious. Trade customers' sales invoices are automatically generated by the system on the day the online order is placed. You see? <laughs> you see? I told you. Potential cutoff problem. And that's why in the substantive procedures for revenue, now I've read that, my cutoff test, I want to refer specifically to the trade customers auditors, oh, trade, yeah, trade customers orders around the year end because of this problem. Now, while I'm on that subject, another substantive procedure that I ought to put in is now that I have read that there are four customers who have specific prices, we'll use the story then and pick out some invoices from those four specific hotel customers and agree back to their contracts to make sure the prices are right. Would be another test I could add to that answer and a good one because it's using the story, not just straight out of a textbook. And these, those are always the safest answers. Always best to use the story if you can. So, uh, the prices are inserted in accordance with the website rates, as we know. Occasionally, Hummingbird makes special offers or discounts. When this occurs, the master file data has to be amended to ensure the correct prices are used on invoices. Any amendment should not be done by anybody called a clerk. This task is usually performed by, drumroll, a clerk. Okay, a senior sales ledger clerk. Fantastic but they're still a clerk, and the job of a clerk is to do as told, not be making these sorts of changes. Why is this a problem? Clerk might apply Wrong discounts. Or 
or apply them after discount period ended leading to losses of revenue. So if you don't want the clerk to do it, who else should do it? Uh, a senior sales manager or even sales director, perhaps. Should be only person. able to make such changes on a master file using a specific password. Now, again, I'm looking at this one thinking, I'm not sure if I want this in my answer because it's so similar to one of the previous ones. But that's just a fault with the question. Um, in asking for seven deficiencies, can't help feeling we're getting an element of repetition in here. How are we doing? One, two, three, four, five. But four and a half, because look, we haven't done the segregation of duties, but now we've been told there is another clerk. So surely we now write Brenda's duties should be divided between Whoops, her and the senior sales ledger clerk or the other clerk being senior could review Brenda's work perhaps. Five down, need two more. One more paragraph. On a monthly basis, statements are sent to the hotel customers. Well, you do that with your customers. You send them a monthly statement, partly to confirm what's happened, but also to encourage them to pay what they owe. A number of trade customers have been requesting monthly statements and Hummingbird is considering this request. In other words, at the moment, they are not doing this. Seems like an easy one. If trade customers get no statement, mistakes in company's records less likely to get noticed and resolved. Also, trade company less quick in paying if no statement prompting them. Right, we have a recommendation to do. Uh, as you know, I don't write out entire answers for every question. If we did that, we wouldn't see enough questions. With this one, I've carried on all the way to recommendation or deficiency six and one more coming after this. There is a reason I'm doing this. You see, now we've got so far into this question, including taking a break in the middle. Do you even remember what the question asked? Do you remember the exam technique that I reminded you of at the top of the page? Because it would be so easy now as we're getting tireder to look at this one and say monthly statements should be sent to trade customers as well. I know, but try to say who should send them or how should they be sent. Well, assuming you've got a computerized system, when you get a statement from your credit card company or the bank or something, there's not a human being with a pen writing that out. That's all being automatically generated by the system, isn't it? Especially if you email them. 
So try and add some value to it. And say the sales ledger should be set up to automatically email a statement to all customers on a monthly basis. I might even go further and say requesting customers contact uh, this company, Hummingbird, if they have any queries about their statement and that would help to resolve any potential problems. Six down. I've tried to avoid anything that looks a bit odd or subtle or I'm not too sure, which was the stuff in here, in the middle of there, and just gone for the easier ones. There's one sentence left, I'm hoping this is number seven. The company only reconciles the sales ledger control account at the end of September for the year end balance, which means they are therefore not doing it at other times. And that to me looks like a fairly easy one. What is the reconciliation of the sales ledger control account? That is where you take the total receivables and check it against the sum of the individual customer balances because those should be the same two things. Why do we do that? Uh, to highlight mistakes. So if they don't do it, or only do it once a year, if control account only reconciled annually, problems occurring earlier in the accounting year will go unfound for months leading to upset customers if it's a mistake affecting them and making it harder to investigate if problem happened months ago. Nice easy one to do here. Someone other than Brenda, otherwise it would be self-review, wouldn't it? So, try to say who should do it. I'm going to try and say how it should be done. So I'm not going to say reconcile, I'm going to say the actual thing that is done. Should reconcile sales ledger control account to list of uh, customer balances every month end and investigate and correct any problems found. I've got who, how, how often. Trying to add as much value as possible. To make sure I get a mark in each column each time and not a half. And there we have it. Another question done. Just going back to the substantive procedures for revenue, I took an assertion-based approach and tried to do a test for completeness, a test for occurrence, a test for cutoff and accuracy, as I think those are the four easier assertions for profit or loss items to do. Another approach I could have taken is the AEIOU approach. Analytical is comparing. I could have compared sales 
to the hotels especially on a month by month basis because I'm expecting hotels to have a fairly regular usage of the items that they're putting in the rooms. I could compare month by month versus the prior year or month by month versus budget. Because if you've done a deal with a hotel, I'm guessing you've agreed the sort of amounts they're likely to be buying from you, which means your forecast for the year should be pretty accurate. Enquiry. I suppose we might ask the four hotel customers to confirm how much they've bought from our client during the year. So I could take that approach. Uh, I could inspect the agreements with the hotels to see how much they have guaranteed they will buy each year. Because I bet to get their discounts they've had to promise to achieve certain sales levels. Uh, you recalculate. Recalculate the discounts being applied to invoices. You see what's happening here. AEIOU helps me to think of additional tests I didn't think of when I did the assertions approach. Now, you only need four tests for this question, and I can do that easily. I could come up with 44, I would imagine. But you, of course, haven't had 20 and a half years of doing these exercises over and over again. You don't have that repetition and practice. So use as many methods as possible to come up with your ideas. And I've done assertions, A-E-I-O-U, and I've used the scenario. Fantastic. Now this is class number three. We have been hitting uh, uh, risk and response planning, audit risk in other words. That controls substantive. We've been hitting those very, very hard. But we're heading towards the uh, end of revision number three, and that leaves us one more. And in revision number four, what have we still got left to do? Because this will be next week, so we're getting very close to the exam now. And I suppose the two main topics uh, we've not touched at all are internal audit and corporate governance. So we ought to have a little look at those tonight before we see another question. Uh, we have looked at audit reports in terms of content and the outcomes, but we've not done a question yet. Uh, we'll save that, I think, for next week. Uh, so let's have a little internal audit and corporate governance stuff before we move on to another question. Uh, let's have a little look at some internal audit. Now this is mostly knowledge, which makes it a far from interesting thing to study. So let me remind you what you're meant to know. What does it do? Why is it needed, perhaps? A comparison versus external audit. The pros and cons of outsourcing. And why external audit might want to rely on internal audit. I would say are probably the five most likely things you'd want to know. Now there is one particular role of internal audit which I'll uh, be putting up on the screen in a second or two uh, and you are meant to know a little bit about what that role means but we'll come back to that. Roles of internal audit. Testing controls. But you might remember, when we looked at internal controls, that companies need internal controls for five main reasons. And those five main reasons translate very nicely into five specific roles that internal auditors might do. For example, we need controls to try and reduce fraud, and internal auditors do investigations when we think fraud might have happened. We need controls to safeguard assets. And so internal auditors will do stock takes to make sure that the assets the company thinks it has are there. We need controls to prevent breaching of laws and regulations. So internal audit will do 
compliance audits to check we are following the rules. We are worried about inefficiency, so internal audit may do value for money audits. More on those in the final class. And internal audit, sorry, internal controls are needed to protect the accuracy of internal management accounting information. So internal audit can test the management accounts accuracy. So why might a company feel like it needs internal audit? Because in most industries, it's not compulsory. Why might you feel you need it? Well, look at the blue stuff above. If that's what internal audit does, presumably you would need internal audit if you've had lots of control failures recently, or you've suffered fraud recently, or your assets have been stolen recently, or you've been breaching laws and regulations, or maybe the laws and regulations have recently changed and you're worried you might be breaching them. Uh, profit margins are falling because that might suggest inefficiency, hence a value for money audit. Uh, or you've discovered errors in your management accounts. And all of those would be clues that your company would need it. Internal audit versus external audit. Well, the main things to look at here are legal requirement, external audit is, internal audit typically isn't. Following of standards, external auditors must follow international standards on auditing. Internal audit standards do exist but they tend to be voluntary rather than you must. Obviously their roles are different. Independence, the external auditor must be the internal auditor employed by the company. So there's a limit to how independent they will ever be. And who appoints them? Now at the end of the day, if it's a listed company, the audit committee will be heavily involved in both but shareholders are the ultimate employers of external auditors, whereas the board of directors can choose its internal auditors. Pluses and minuses of outsourcing. Well, we're going to be meeting that in a question, if my memory is correct, in the final class. Uh, so I'm not going to write anything on the screen at this point, otherwise we just end up repeating ourselves. But come on, you know the pros and cons of outsourcing anything. I mean, take a simple example. Uh, you could uh, iron your own shirts, or you could outsource it and have them dry cleaned and get someone else to do it for you. What are the benefits? Well, if you rubbish your ironing, someone else does loads of it, you get their expertise, you get well-ironed shirts. Hooray. What's a downside? You've got to pay for it. It's probably cheaper if you do it yourself. Another downside, you've got to wait. If you need a shirt ironed today, you iron it yourself. If you can wait a couple of days, fine, outsource. Another problem, confidentiality. You might have a slightly dodgy shirt with a slightly dodgy stain where no one can actually see the stain and only you know it's there. But if you let someone else wash your clothes, they start to see what bad dress sense you've got and they know about that dodgy stain that will never come out. Mm. They might tell their friend, oh look, there's the guy with the dodgy stain. Uh, what else? Pros and cons. Um, independence. Doesn't really work for shirts, does it? Doesn't work. And that's the main one to remember, is the benefit of outsourcing internal audit is independence of the function should increase. But another benefit of outsourcing anything is if you don't have to iron your shirts, think of the time you will save that you could better spend on your core competencies. Why external audit might rely on internal audit. Now because this involves external audit, there is an audit standard guiding us external auditors 
on this very subject. And there are two main angles to this. The external auditor needs to test the client's controls. The internal audit have been doing that all year anyway. So do we really need to test stuff again when someone else has already tested it? And the answer to that question is external auditors can use internal audit results from these tests, but only if you think those results are reliable. How do you check the reliability? First, check the reliability of the internal auditors. Now, reliability is not a yes or a no. It's on levels, isn't it? So you need to look at some variables and then make an assessment. And you'd look at things like, to what extent have they got professional qualifications? How experienced are they in testing these controls? And you'd need to assess their independence. If after all of that you're thinking, well, we should be okay, you've then got to check the reliability of the work they have done. So you'd need to take a look and make sure it's properly planned and documented because you can't uh, rely on something if you can't see what has happened. And you really ought to re-perform a sample of what they've done. The logic being that if you re-perform some of the tests and get the same conclusions, it suggests that they did exactly what you did, which should make it reliable. Now that bit there has always been an issue, long-standing issue in audit. The next bit is relatively recent and led to that audit standard 610 being updated in 2012 and 2013. Because in reviews done of the work performed by external audit firms, it was noted that many external audit firms were using internal audit staff of their client to help external audit work, especially on the final audit. Uh, those two words don't really make much sense adding them there, so there we go. Let's just keep it nice and basic. Now, I can understand how this would happen. Uh, your client says, can we lower your audit fee if we lend you some of our own staff? They're trying to get the fees down. Can we borrow their staff? So not the work they've done internally already, but actually use their staff on the external audit. And the answer to this question is, you can. Notice the regular word of can here. You can rely on those staff if they appear to be reliable. So you've assessed they're reliable. Next question. Why don't we just get them to do the entire external audit and we can all go home? No, there needs to be a limit. What work can they do? And the answer is low risk, stuff that does not require thought and assessment, so nothing subjective, things that are not particularly material, so basic stuff. Don't get them assessing things like provisions, contingent liabilities, uh, intangible assets, or anything else which requires professional assessment. That ought to be your responsibility. Okay, so that was external auditors relying on internal audit. And a quick review of a lot of internal audit stuff there. Let us now go look at another exam question. And I think we should have a look at 
Well, we've got a choice here. Oh, yeah, we could do that one, I suppose. Three or five. What do we fancy? I think we'll do number three. Uh, looking at the time we've got left, uh, three is a shorter question than five. Five will then do next time. So uh, this one here we're looking at is September, December 2015. And question number three. Now, at the end of gathering our audit evidence and before we write our audit report, there are some finalisation things that we have to do. Uh, subsequent events, we've mentioned that one. Uh, checking the content of the other information, the annual report. Remember other matter paragraphs in audit reports? We've looked at that one as well. But one which can lead, as you can see here, to around about 10 marks a practical question, if she really wants to, is going concern. It's not a subject which I get that overexcited about because the questions tend to be relatively straightforward. There are two main skills we need. The ability to spot things in a story that suggest a company is in trouble. And that's what part A of this question is about. Five things in the story that suggest trouble. But because she's got to tell you those things, they're going to be there in the story. They can't be hidden from you. So trust me, finding five things in here that's a problem is not going to be a problem for us. And then part B, describe the audit procedures. Well, we know what that means, don't we? A-E-I-O-U, getting evidence about D-A-D-A-3. And if you've got a story, anything in that story that looks like a going concern indicator is something we probably want to test. Now let's be very clear here. We are looking for going concern problems in that story. Don't start listing out things that could be going concern problems anywhere. It's got to come from the story. And secondly, we need audit procedures assessing the going concern status of this company. I'm sure we can work out five going concern procedures. You could memorize them before exam day. But we need to apply them to this story here. And I reckon that if we just test the scenario, we'll probably get five tests without ever having to memorize them in advance. And they'll be better because they attach to the story. Now it does say explain five indicators, so you can't just go in there and find something and copy it out. As with the exam overall, you must say here's something from the story, and this is a going concern problem because be do be do be do. Now possibly with this one, Because we are looking for indicators of a problem and some audit procedures, it's almost like a risk and response question and we might want to do it as a two column approach. But some of our procedures might be general ones. We'll try and tailor it to the story as much as possible, but because some might be general, it might not match across perfectly. I'm gonna do it as A, going concern threats indications or indicators and then part B will be my procedures. I'm going to leave enough space for one, two, three, four, five and then just for safety I'll need enough space for a six if I need it, and then procedures here, because I'm thinking, as I read through, I may well think up procedures based on the story as I go. So I might want to be writing both answers at the same point. Oh, there we go. Here we go then, not the biggest story in the world, and that's because the clues are gonna be pretty obvious. 
Mercury Motoring specializes in manufacturing engine parts for motor cars, and the company has a diverse customer base, but seven significant customers. The company's year end was the 30th of September. During the year, a number of the company's significant customers have experienced a fall in sales and consequently purchased fewer items from Mercury. Well, that is a potential going concern problem. Sales are falling, but it's a bit basic and I want to find the best ones. As a result, Mercury has paid a number of its suppliers later than usual and some of them, with, with, some of them have withdrawn credit terms meaning the company must pay cash on delivery. I like that one, because that one I can add some uh, I cannot talk anymore. So uh, that one I can add some explanation to. The first one, sales have fallen, is so basic, I don't want to use it unless I have to. One of Mercury's main suppliers is threatening legal action to recover the sums owing. Well, legal action doesn't sound like a good thing, and I can add to that. As a result of the increased level of payables, the company's current ratio has fallen from 1 to 0 0.9 for the first time. I'm doing that one as well. That's given me three good ones already. Mercury has produced a cash flow forecast for 30th of June 2016, and this shows net outflows until May. Well, if cash is going to continually leave the business, that's going to make life harder. Mercury has a loan of 2.3 million, which is due for repayment in full by the 30th of September. Let's face it, this is looking very like a risk and response question, isn't it? It's just all the risks are about cash flow problems. The finance director has just informed the audit manager there is a possible change in legislation which will result in one of Mercury's top product lines becoming obsolete as it will not comply with the proposed law. Number seven. The prepared cash flow forecasts do not reflect this possible event, which means that this problem here, number five, is a lot worse than the forecasts suggest. Seems to me there are seven in here. The fact that they have seven significant customers might also be a concern because it's not that many. And if any of those seven were to go, well, one seventh, what's that? 14 and a bit percent. That's a fairly sizable chunk of revenue that you might lose if one customer goes bust. So maybe that's an eighth one. I don't know. But I don't need eight. I need five. So I pick the ones out where I can add the most. So I'm going to start with number two. They have been paying their suppliers late and credit terms have been removed. So the loss of credit terms from suppliers Now, a lot of students will write, credit terms have been lost. The danger is that's the end of a sentence and you stop writing. I'm going to use the information rather than just restate it. The loss of credit terms from suppliers is a sign of how upset suppliers are. If any suppliers decide to stop supplying at all, it will be hard to replace them. Given company's reputation, of not paying on time. And if supplies don't turn up, this would lead to disruption Whoops. to production. Now I could go on explaining this one for some time. It's only worth a mark. But what I'm trying to do, as I've done throughout this course on every question, is don't just state the blooming obvious. 
add some detail to it, explain why this is a problem. I mean, I could have taken a different route and said, what if they don't have the cash to pay the supplier up front, then they have no supplies, which will definitely disrupt production. And now I've written that, I'm thinking that there's a fairly obvious procedure to do, which is inspect correspondence with all major suppliers to see if there have been any threats of stopping production completely. to remove all supplies why am I doing this? to verify if continuation of supplies is a problem and what's good about that procedure is it is not straight out of a textbook, although I'm betting it is in textbooks where it says tests ongoing concern. I have used the story. I've not had to try and memorize it. I'm testing the scenario. I like number three, legal action. That could cause you problems, couldn't it? So, going concern threat, if the legal action is successful, the costs could add a significant problem. to cash flows already looking weak. Haven't written enough. Two lines doesn't feel quite enough. I'm going to add a bit more. Uh, if you are taken to court, there's also the joy of reputation damage. from the case could lead to losing customers or other suppliers or lead to other court cases. It's an unfortunate problem that once you're in court once other people try their luck because they think that judges will say well if they've been in court before, increases the chance of guilt. So, uh, as auditor, I need to know stuff about this legal case to understand how likely it is they'll lose, how much we're talking about, obvious tests to do. Obtain information from clients' legal advisors. So inquire, E, A, E, I, O, U, E, inquire and confirm as to likely costs of defending claim likelihood of loss and potential amount of damages, always try and force yourself to do this to verify the likely impact on cash flows. And there you've got your explanation. Always try and say why. Force yourself into the habit. Number four, a bit of a cleverer one, this one, I suppose. Uh, the current ratio is below one, and you're meant to know what that means. 
going concern threat. A current ratio of less than one suggests companies' current assets are too low to meet current liabilities. Meaning without new finance, company cannot pay its debts. as they fall due. This will further disrupt supplies. Who else do you pay? Um, your staff? Paying staff? which could lead to strikes and further, therefore, disruption. Now that one is tempting me to think about a procedure. Uh, there's no point checking the current ratio, it is what it is. But I mentioned there without new finance they're going to have problems and it is a standard going concern test to do, which is inspect correspondence with shareholders and bank and banks to assess board's ability. to get new finance in the short term. Notice, always explaining why. As and when needed. And I'm now thinking a fourth procedure similar to that one, which is also read recent board minutes to assess board's plans to reverse current going concern problems. Why are you doing that? So that you can then assess the likelihood of these plans succeeding. And board minutes are great, but you know what I'm also thinking? Which again, I always do as standard. So this is a bit of a standard test, but it doesn't stop it being right. I think we need to obtain a written, signed representation from the board. of their belief that the company is a going concern with a justification of why. Given there are problems, I think they need to prove it to us. Uh, is that five tests? Unos, dos, tres, cuatro. Yeah, it is indeed. Now, I've already got all the tests I need. It said they've done forecasts. Um, those forecasts were not for a whole year, only I think nine months. Another procedure therefore would be to ask the company to extend those forecasts for at least an extra three months so that we can uh, assess a full year after the year end. But even for the forecasts that we've got, we know they're out of date. We know that because it's said in the question that the forecasts did not reflect the change in the law. So I think we need to ask the client 
to flex the forecasts to show how much worse situation will be once the law change takes effect. Always saying why. Uh, we ought to check when this law change comes into play and make sure it only affects one product. So inspect announcement of law change. Uh, maybe using legal advice as necessary. to verify when change due to happen and that it only affects one product and not others, which it might do. Now I'm going to stop on the procedures because you can tell there are just too many. Uh, we haven't got all one, two, three. We've only got three so far. We need to explain some other indicators. So let's do that. I've done two, three, and four. Uh, number six, the loan. I think that's a fairly easy one. So that's going in the answer. Uh, if the loan repayment cannot be made, the bank might add penalties which company cannot afford it would seem or attempt to put the company into liquidation to get its money back. Which of course gives rise to another procedure. Inspect the loan agreement to see what the penalties are. Uh, inspect correspondence with the bank to see if there's been any attempt so far to push that loan repayment back. Does the bank sound happy with the company, unhappy with the company? I need one more. What was number seven? Uh, the law results in one of Mercury's top product lines. Now again, this is pretty obvious, isn't it? But if a major product line is lost without replacement by new products, The further reduction on sales, or reduction in sales, because they've already had other reductions, of course, at a time when company is already suffering so many problems, could be enough to shut them down. I could, as always, go further, but I go on the lines of two to three lines is normally enough, given the time constraint, if nothing else, uh, and say, I'm guessing they don't have the money to do the research and development to find the new products. They're stuck, aren't they? Uh, that tells me of another audit procedure, but I've already written it down, because the audit procedure I'm thinking is, how much of forecast sales are for that product? Let's whip them out of the forecast and see how much worse it gets. But I've already written it down, haven't I? Yay. There we have it. Another question done. Uh, going concern questions are never difficult. In some ways, that's what makes them difficult because the clues in the story are so obvious, the temptation is just to copy them out. As with control deficiencies, 
You can't just copy stuff out. You've got to add to it. Always remember that. Okay then, uh, we've got about two minutes left, uh, which is enough time for me to sneak in one final little technical bit of revision. I mentioned earlier uh, corporate governance. Which we'll need to spend a bit of time on in our final lecture. Lecture? No, revision. In our final practice session. So I'm not going to get into any detail now, but I'll just remind you of a few of the basics you are meant to know. What is corporate governance? It's the systems, policies, and procedures used to try to run an organization or company, if you prefer, properly. What does properly mean? In the best interests of the people whose company it is, the shareholders. So why do we need this? Why is this considered a problem? Well, largely the agency problem. In other words, directors might run the company in their own benefit or run it badly. In other words, incompetently, inefficiently, etc. And once you realize that's what this is all about, if we then look at what areas corporate governance covers, it all makes sense, doesn't it? Because it covers the roles of an effective board, who should be, or not be, on the board. The roles of the key players on the board, chairman, CEO, the non-execs. The roles of the key board committees, so remuneration, nomination, and the audit committees. It's got rules on director pay because they could easily act in their own best interests and pay themselves a fortune. It's got guidance on how to manage risks and use controls. That brings in the role of internal audit and it looks at communication between the board and shareholders. So the shareholders can hold the board to account for running the company in their best interests. So a little reminder there that hopefully gets a few thoughts off in your mind. You know, same person shouldn't be chairman and chief executive. Non-executives would be so much better if they're independent and stuff like that. And some of that we'll be covering in our final class Aren't we having fun? Yes, we are. So we've got through another bank of questions. We're now very heavily practiced on the core areas of the course. And our final class will be mopping things up. Some audit report questions, uh, internal, uh, internal audits and corporate governance, and a few other bits and pieces to fill it all out. But for now, we have reached the end of revision class number three. So it is time for me to bid farewell. I will see you next week for the final instalment. For now, good night. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye.